Hey everybody, this is DJ Paul, and in this video is what I want to do is talk about what I consider to be a typical wedding timeline. Now, when I say typical, I, I don't mean to say that every wedding is going to be the same, and obviously, there's no such thing as a typical wedding anyway, because every wedding is going to be unique and special. But the idea is, is to use some of these guidelines when you're planning your wedding to create a timeline to make sure that you stay on schedule and you generally get all the events done that are important to you. Now, these timelines are never followed exactly 100%, and that's why all of us in the industry say it's a guideline, not a timeline. Inevitably, things are going to take longer. Some things may take shorter amounts of time, and the generally what the reason we have a timeline isn't to follow it on the dot for every second, but instead to just make sure you have ample time to do all the things that are important to you. And it also makes sure, in addition to that, that if you have a planner or a DOE, which is a day of event coordinator, just helps keep the rest of your vendors on track and on schedule so that everything happens uh, more smoothly and all your vendors are ready and in position when these special moments happen. Now, when you're creating this timeline, perhaps the first thing you want to decide is how long you want your wedding to be. Now, most weddings we do tend to be from four to seven hours and five would be probably like the average or the standard time. And that's our probably most popular time that people use when they're booking us. But we've seen longer weddings, you know, eight hours, 11 hours. It really just depends. The thing that you want to think about, though, is how many guests you have and generally the more guests you have, the longer your wedding is going to take to get everyone to have food and more people means a more lively dance floor on, on average. So just be realistic about what you expect and how long you think your guests are going to want to be there is perhaps the most important decision you make when you're starting to decide on your timeline. And of course, the advice that I always give to the couples that are getting married when I'm DJing their weddings is if you do this right, this is the last time or the only time you get to do this. So try to enjoy it. Um, not everything's going to follow schedule. Not everything's going to happen maybe the way you imagined it. But the point is to have fun and make sure that it's your special day so that it's about you and you get to do all the things that are important to you. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by kind of going through a regular timeline or perhaps a, a, a example timeline. And then hopefully I can give some pointers about why I recommend doing making these decisions with the hope that when you look at this, when you watch this video, you can take the, these ideas and adopt them and modify them to create your own timeline. And one of the nice things is having a planner or a coordinator will really help you create this timeline and also give you advice when you're designing it too, which is why I highly recommend hiring a planner or at least a DOE or Dave event coordinator for your wedding. I call them the wedding therapist. They make sure everyone else is in line and they're there to reassure you about everything. So in general, this wedding is going to be a five hour reception. So the ceremony is going to start at 5 p.m. and then the departure is going to be at 10 p.m. So ceremony starts at five and most wedding ceremonies take about 30 minutes, especially if they're on site. Now, most of the weddings I do are in Texas and in Texas, most wedding venues will have an on site ceremony. But of course, certain weddings like Catholic weddings where they need to get married at a church that can take a little bit longer. So I would say give at least an hour, 30 minutes for the reception, and then 30 minutes for people to get in their cars and drive back, and then cocktail hour starts. And then after that, of course, cocktail hours or the, the main reception starts, and that's where people move to the reception hall where the reception's going to be. And most of the time, this cocktail hour takes 45 minutes to an hour. And I would say this is the time that gets pushed back the most in the sense that the grand entrance usually will happen later if there's one thing that's going to get off schedule. And that's just because during this cocktail hour is usually when you're going to be taking all your pictures. And the limiting, I guess, piece of this is your sunlight. So if you're taking outside pictures, you only have until the sun goes down. But most of the time, these pictures take longer because that's when your bridal party, you guys as the couple and the rest of your family are going to be posing and doing all these pictures. Now, you can get away with a 30 or 45 minute cocktail hour if you do things like a first look or other sorts of pictures beforehand but most of the time people are in such a frazzle or they just end up taking longer anyway even if they do account for less time so keep that in mind um, usually cocktail hour 50 minutes to an hour is probably standard with an hour being the most popular then after that you do your grand entrance and that's of course when you guys are introduced as the couple the rest of your bridal party and then sometimes the family and you have a big entrance and after that, you get to decide if you want to do your special dances right after the grand entrance or whether you want to do those later in the night. Now, I always recommend couples to do the first dance 
father daughter and mother son or any of those special dances right there after the grand entrance because you make that announcement everybody comes in and then you guys share your first dance together and i think that makes a lot of sense rather than it being a little bit anticlimactic like all right here we are and now let's start dinner once again up to you but i would say 60 to 70 percent of the weddings we do we do at least that first dance right after the grand entrance but of course you can do it later and it's really up to you and what your preferences are there so I've kind of divided this timeline up into three different blocks and I've color coded it. So this first block is kind of like the cocktail hour part. The second block is kind of like the dinner part. And then the third block is sort of the open dancing or the dance floor portion of the night. So just kind of an idea of how I would block this out. So generally after you do your grand entrance and whether or not you do your special dances is at that point, usually there's a welcome and blessing. Now, in Texas, there tends to be a lot more religious weddings, so usually the officiant is there giving a blessing or members of the family giving a welcome. And then after that, we move into the main course or dinner. And I would say at least try to budget 45 minutes to an hour for dinner, especially if your dinner is buffet style. If your dinner is plated, meaning there are going to be servers that are delivering plates to everybody's table, it can take a little less time because they're out there actually handing out the plates and they can have those plates ready to go as opposed to everyone having to get up and go to the buffet. But this is another place that can take a lot longer than you think. And my general rule of thumb is 20 to 30 minutes per 50 people. So weddings in Texas actually tend to be a little bit smaller. So if you have 100 guests, it would probably take about 40 to 45 minutes for all those 100 guests to get through the buffet. If you have 150 guests, it probably will take about an hour for all those guests to get through the buffet. And you can kind of do the math that way. If you only have 50 guests, you can probably get them all through the buffet in 20 minutes, but that doesn't mean they're all gonna be done eating by that time. It's just usually that's about the time that all those tables have had a chance to get through and they're all getting called. When it's a plated dinner, you can probably cut that time maybe in half by the time everybody gets their food. But then, of course, people still want to have time to eat. Now, during dinner, you have a little bit of flexibility if you want to do certain activities. And usually I find that people like to do their toasts towards the end of dinner because that's usually when people are still eating, but they're kind of getting done. And if you're doing champagne or anything like that, it's kind of a good time to transition into the next portion of the evening. So I always tend to recommend people do your toast kind of as dinner's ending, but this can be a little bit flexible and this can be a good time if you have a coordinator or a planner for them to kind of use their best judgment about when they should be doing the toast. Then after toasts, usually people move into the cake cutting. So that would be after the toasts. And for toasts, usually I budget, I recommend people budget five minutes per person toasting. So if you have three people toasting, then that's going to be about 15 minutes. If you have two people, maybe 10 minutes. Um, if you have five people, maybe it'll take 25 minutes to 30 minutes. It just depends. And I know some couples who will actually put time limits or they'll try to tell the people toasting, Hey, like try to keep it under this amount of time because this can take longer and this can actually end up encroaching into that time that you have for open dancing. So keep that in mind too. I'm not necessarily recommending that you do that, but if you're expecting five people to be giving toasts, um, 20 to 30 minutes isn't an unreasonable amount of time to expect for those. And maybe if that's the case, starting that earlier in dinner, that way you still get enough time to do all the activities you want to do in case things run a little bit longer. Now it's interesting, after cake cutting, if you guys want to do the anniversary dance or the longest married couple dance, I always recommend people to do that before opening the dance floor. And there are two reasons that I recommend that. The first reason being that generally a lot of the older couples tend to leave the wedding early because they get tired. So doing this early ensures that the couple that's actually married the longest, if you do plan on doing it, are going to be there to win, basically, and they're not going to be gone. And the second reason for that is from a DJ's perspective, doing the anniversary dance in the middle of open dancing, which we sometimes do, um, is basically... Uh, a time that we clear the entire dance floor because we get all the couples out there, all the married couples, and we eliminate them based on how long they've been married. So at the end of it, you're just left with the couple that's married the longest, and then it makes our job as a DJ a little bit harder because now we have to get everyone else back out on the dance floor. So that's why we try to recommend people if they're going to do an anniversary or longest married couple dance to do that before opening the dance floor. Then of course we open the dance floor and from there, we can, you know, this is where things can be a little bit flexible because that's where as the DJ, it's more our job at that point, you know, keeping the crowd engaged and playing all the music that you guys want to hear. And usually through in the middle of about that, that time that open, the dance floor is open, we'll do something like the bouquet toss and the garter toss. Usually the bouquet toss is first and the garter toss is after, but it really just depends. Some people haven't been doing the garter toss and just think about, do you want to do those activities or do you not want to? That's totally up to you. No right or wrong way to do it. 
Then after that, towards the end of the night, you get to do your last dance at maybe around 9.55. And of course, the wedding ending at 10. So 10 o'clock would be the couple's departure or when you guys leave in either the limo or your vehicle and everyone goes home. Now, certain venues can have a pretty hard requirement. So if you want to go longer, ask them if, if in case you do want to go a little bit longer, if they have any noise ordinance or something like that in case people do want to be dancing longer. But most of the time, I find that a five-hour reception um, guarantees about two hours of open dancing. And in that case, that's generally a pretty good amount of time for most people to get all their dancing out and then they're tired, they want to go home. I've done wedding receptions that are seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, maybe even 11 hours. Um, and those couples really knew the guests that were coming and knew that they wanted to dance and they were really realistic about it. And they could have gone for another hour because people were having such a good time. Now with a four hour reception, you can only really realistically expect an hour, maybe an hour and a half of open dancing. And with a five hour reception, maybe two hours is the standard time, maybe two and a half hours. And that's also assuming that everything goes to schedule and doesn't get pushed back too much. But once again, being realistic about your family, how much dancing you expect there to be, are you a big dancing crowd and family, or are you guys just generally gonna be there to socialize? That's something to really talk about or with yourselves and your family before making that decision about how long you want your reception to be. Now, the, the reason I like this timeline too and having the bouquet and garter toss somewhere in the middle is it allows us as a DJ to kind of split the night into kind of two different sections. The first section, that first hour of open dancing, we're generally gonna be playing a lot of the more popular hits that everyone's going to know. So that includes things like hits from the 70s, 80s, 90s, throwbacks from the early 2000s, and then some of the more popular modern songs that everyone's going to know. And then what ends up happening is as the night goes on, families with young children and some of the older guests tend to leave a little bit earlier, which makes sense. People with young children, children getting tired and things. And that way, if you want your your wedding to get a little bit ratchet or more like a club-like atmosphere where you're playing maybe more hip hop and EDM, you have that last hour to kind of go in that direction. So you can kind of, it allows us to break up the night. And once again, every wedding's different and we go by based on what the crowd is feeling and what people like. But that's generally my rule of thumb is starting out getting a feel for what people like, playing those hits for all ages, playing some more slow dances and things. And then of course the younger people, the bridal party, those people tend to stay and then playing the music catering a little bit more towards the remaining guests. Anyway, I hope you guys have found this general wedding timeline and or guideline helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave something in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Once again, I've been to kind of dozens, if not hundreds of weddings. So hopefully this advice is helpful and it also inspires you to create your own timeline and share that with your vendors or with your planner or DOE if you have one, just to make sure that everything goes smoothly and you do get a chance to do all those activities that are important to you. And if you're getting married, of course, congratulations, because it's going to be the best time of your life and you only get to do it once. So do your best to enjoy it. Thanks. Bye.